Oh, wait, is it going to open this one? Hey! So let's just go over it, though. Let's all open an, an, another one, just the, the old classic way. So you have a file, like a photo file, and you double click on it. It's not necessarily going to open in Photoshop. Um, the best way to get it open in Photoshop flawlessly is to go ahead and open Photoshop like we did. Just ignore that welcome screen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us back. If you already had the Ginkgo open, just follow along with me because we can do this again. But I'm going to say, let's start it up again here. Okay, so uh, we'll go over here to open, or you can also, if you've already opened it, go to file, open. All right, and then this brings up our file browser, which is Finder in this case, because we're on a Mac. And by the way, is anybody completely new to Mac? Is anybody completely new to Mac? Is everybody completely new to Mac? You used it this morning. Well, this morning, but yeah, well. like before that. <laughs> you meant before this morning. Okay. I was about to be like, what? No. Okay. I see what you mean. Well, if you get, if, if, if you have any questions about any of the Finder stuff, just let me know. But basically, you know, you've got this column over here, which is like sort of your main table of contents, so to speak. And for us, we need to go to the server to get these photos. So, down here, you should see one that says... DSADC, and inside that there should be a folder called users. Double click on that, and inside that folder, double click on DS class. I know, fun, right? And I'm going to wait here, make sure everybody sees these class titles. I don't. You don't? Okay. Well, where did you last get lost off the trail? I'm on DS class, so I've got those folders within it. And you mean these the folders? These folders? No. Okay. You want to go in the users folder. Okay, well then what I want you to do is look over here on this column. You might be on this one or the home one. You need to be on the one with the little computer icon. There's so, yeah. Yeah, there's another deal. There are a lot of pitfalls on the trail. But I mean, I, I specifically had them design it hard like this on purpose for you guys. Okay, so I went to users, so. I clicked on that, then users. DS class. DS class, yeah. Yeah. Now I gotta hold on, yeah. Okay. okay. Yep, I mean, like I said, there's lots of landmines to step on. I'm aware, that's why I tried <laughs> Okay. Uh, and then in here, we want to go to Photoshop Basics. And then there should be some Ginkgo's in here. Now, it doesn't really matter which of these two that you open, either the PSD or the JPEG. Um, and on that note, so just double click on it and it'll open it up. On that note, do you know the difference between a PNG and a JPEG? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you know what a JPEG is. Not necessarily, no. It can be an attachment. A, an attachment could be any kind of file. It's like a dumbed down file. Like it's because you've got raw, which is kind of like a lot of detail in the file. A JPEG is kind of more a compressed file. There you go. Keyword compressed. Yes. Um, it, it, it's a raster image. I'm going to throw some terminology at you guys because it's important. Anytime you see raster, resolution, pixelation, you see those little squares? Those are called pixels. And a digital image is made up of nothing but thousands and millions of those little guys. How many? That is what resolution, which you were talking about, detail, uh, and compression, and things of that nature affect. Okay. So different images have different resolution sizes. This is converse to a vector file. Like you had an illustrator this morning, which is not dependent on pixels. The pixels that you see are only relative to it based upon what size you currently have it zoomed. These pixels, I'm afraid, are locked in. 
So if I go here to image, image size, just give you some theory. This is 72 DPI. Not so great, okay? It used to be great for web. 300 is about what you want. So that means 300 squares per inch, okay? Um, now you can always do the math on these to get the amount of pixels. But here it is right here. It's this number times this number. Now these numbers aren't too bad. This is where you have to put on your math caps for me real quick. So it's 72, it's 34 inches by 34 inches at 72. If I change it to 300, um, sorry, if I switch it to 300, it took it down to 8.16 image and 8.16. It's the same difference. Okay. Less inches with more pixels in them is the same as more inches with less pixels in them. Make sense? Kind of? No? Okay. Say that again. Well, resolution and size of your image in inches, it's all relative. When it's in Photoshop, it really only cares about pixels, but we care about both. Okay, so if it only had 72 pixels per inch and it was 30 by 30, but then it had 300 pixels an inch, but it was eight by eight, they're the exact same size. So fewer square inches with more pixels is also equal to more square inches with less pixels, if that makes sense. It's all about how many, how dense they are in there. It's density. But for you guys, I would always recommend to try to keep things at 300. You can go higher, you don't really need to. Now, why do I say all this? And why is this guy going on and on about all this theoretical math stuff? Because has anyone ever, let's see, Tiger. Has anyone ever done a image search? Don't take me there. Has everyone done Google images searches before? Or anyone not done them? Okay, so if you go to Google, you can type anything up there and then you've got an images. It's actually probably gonna be the first one. Okay, uh, and then beyond that, you can go to tools. You didn't used to be able to do this. You can go to tools. See, each of these has a number. See that? Notice how it's not telling me inch by inch. It's telling me pixel size. Okay, uh, some of these will be 72. Some of them are going to be 300. But again, it's all relative based on pixels when you're looking at it inside of a computer screen. Computer doesn't care about inches. That's only when you're going to print it, right? Um, I mean, it can have value, but the pixels is kind of the, the most important thing. So if we go over here to size, okay, and then actually let me just pick a, pick a popular image um, that's going to have some, um, trying to find one that's going to have some, uh, well, those are pretty, some of the same pictures. If I go to one and then I can do something called a reverse image search. So probably one of these really popular ones. Let's see, where's search Google for this image? The Trans-Siberian <laughs> Tiger. Oh. Let's take a look at this image. Save it real quick. And I'm gonna open it up. Just giving you guys this preamble so you'll, you'll understand resolution. Because the last thing I want you guys to do is end up with a low res image. So, looks great right there. Looks great right there. It starts looking not so great now, okay? Now, if I reduce the resolution without also adjusting the height, so I'll leave it at that, but I'll take it down to 72. Whoops, cancel that. Let me try that again. So I'm taking pixels out. I'm reducing pixel density, but I'm keeping the size the same. By doing that, it's going to have to reduce its resolution, which is going to make it blockier. And we've all seen low-res images, all right? So if I do 72, 
This is gonna look pretty bad. Check it out. Look at it now. A little different, right? Because it's cl clustering them all up. The more pixels you have, the more definition that you have. The more gradual any kind of curved line is gonna be, any kind of detail. Stuff will totally get lost in that one. You know, a lot of these details will get lost. And in compression, you also get weird side effects beyond that um, in JPEGs. So I know this is a lot to throw at you in the beginning. Basically, there's just really run one rule. Keep it high res if you can. Uh, you get these weird halos around stuff, these little squares on squares. If you've ever zoomed in on some images before, you may have seen these. It's a side effect. It's a phenomenon on based upon the way a computer sees a picture. And this is actually talking about it. It goes from top left to bottom right. Da -da 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 it has no idea what's represented. It's counting squares. You know, it's like all the way in Rain Man land. It doesn't even know what it's representing. Right, so it 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 gets these weird little artifacts and errors. So basically, try to stay high res, and if you derez something, it's a one way trip. Okay, because if I went to this, okay, and then saved it, and then even if I try to up the resolution again, let's say, oh no, I want to go back to three hundred. Well, it's already lost all that information, so that almost looks even worse. You can't ever get it back, guys. You can't ever get it back. Popular media has got this so wrong because you'll be watching like a CSI episode and there'll be some security cam footage of some dude robbing a gas station and they'll he'll have a name tag on and they're like, enhance, enhance. It, no, it does not happen that way. Nothing but a blob. Um, so keep your resolution high if you can. It's a one-way trip. Um, always try to keep those numbers large. Um, and with this guy... If you're ever curious about those things, either the pixel dimensions or the resolution, you can always go up to image, image size, and you can check that. And I can make it pixels if I want, or inches. Okay? But it's the density of detail. More, more little squares, the more detail there is. Okay. Any questions on any of that? Okay. So, let me talk a little bit about the landscape we have going on here, okay? And I apologize for the seasonal glare. Um, so here we have, actually, let me do it this way. This will probably be easier. I need to start up a little thingy that I have that will help you guys. I'm going to start up my highlighter. But if I go too fast or you have any questions, please let me know. And did anyone have any questions on resolution? feel like I went on a little too far about it, but hey, I got excited, okay? Um, so you can kind of see where my mouse is now. Over here on the left, we have a toolbar. And we're going to explore each and every tool in turn tonight. I'm kidding, we're not. But we're going to look at some. Over here on the right, these are the application windows. We'll look at a few of those as well. These vary a lot based on what you're doing or what you have um, decided to have out at any time given time because there are a ton of them. Um, if we go up to window, this is where you can control those. So depending on what kind of work you're doing, you may want some of them out. You may not need some of them at all. All right. They do different functions. They basically are just menus of options. The program, everything the program does is up in here somewhere. This is its spinal cord. Okay. But it's also easier to do that kind of stuff over here sometimes, as we'll see in some cases tonight, okay? Those generally live over here on the right side. Sorry, I got this neck thing. Any questions on that? In the middle, that's center stage, that's your document that you have open. You can have more than one document open at any given time, kind of like I have. They'll tab up here, so as you guys have more than one open, they'll tab. But this is considered the canvas. But you're only going to be working on one at a time. It's not a multi-page kind of setup like some other programs are. And last but not least, there's this strip right here 
under the main, that's this is the main menu tree, but right under that, see this strip right here? And it changes with different tools. These are the tool options. So this is actually a pretty important little area to keep an eye on too. Okay. And something we're gonna look at heavily tonight is down here in the layers window. Just make sure you've got this out. See where I am here? It's gonna, I'm gonna go so fast, it's gonna be like a magic trick. You guys are gonna be like, what? Why are they even letting this guy teach? No, I'm kidding. Must be one of those teachers just like comes in and shows off. It's like, yeah, you can do it. One more rep, come on. Body by Jake. All right, so we're gonna learn our first tool. Has anybody ever seen these things? Pretty, right? You ever seen these guys, the little dotted lines? Is that new to anybody? Marching ants. They call them the marching ants. But what that means is it's a selection. And I'm gonna show you several tools here that, that these do. What these do is they separate some pixels from the other pixels. Look, if you, if you look, I, I can zoom way down and I can see the front line right there of the pixel war. I'll show you how I zoom as well. We'll get there. But for now, the first tool that we're going to look at is the marquee. It's the simplest tool that you can make a selection with. Although, this tool is not going to help us to select one of these ginkgos at all. But, sometimes this is a very cool tool to use if you want to make a rectangular shape in your selection. But let's say what we're ideally trying to do is isolate one of these ginkgo leaves and make a copy of that ginkgo leaf. So we're trying to... You know how Jesus had the fish and the loaves? That he fed the whole crowd? That's what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, I mean, not as miraculous, but... Um, because in the digital world, you get that advantage. It's simulation and repetition. I don't know if you guys have been hearing all that, they're like, oh, people are all going to be replaced by simulation. That's kind of, kind of the concept that they're talking about. Because you already have it, you can easily just double it. Because computers. Just like making a copy or sending a fax. So this tool here, basically if you can, you know, if you just wanted to get a crop of that, this would be a fine tool to use. Okay? But we're actually trying to go in and just grab the yellow of the ginkgo. So there's some specialized tools that allow us to do that. I'm going to show you three of those. And, and a couple of them are kind of one and the same. So if we go one tool down, we're on the third tool down. These are the lasso tools. Now, something that I have to tell you about here is Adobe kind of had a funky... Uh, I don't know why they decided to do it this way, but they have multiple tools that share the same spot on the menu, okay? So to bring out the sub-tools or the um, sister tools, if you will, you can either right-click on that tool or you can hold the left mouse button down and it will pop you out a little menu. And the one that we want to go for is the regular old lasso. It's the top one. It's the first of the three on the third tool down. And let me know if you need any help finding it because it's kind of a weird way to arrange your toolbar. I don't know why they do this. It's Adobe for you. Okay, well, I will take silences as a yes, we're good. We're good? Okay. So this tool is basically just freehand. There's a smart, there's like a smart bomb version of it that we're going to use in a minute. But this one is just a, a dumb bomb. It's like spray and pray, you know. So if you click and you hold, you got to hold the mouse button down. And like the idea is you would surgically go around and don't slip your hand because then you got to start all over. You guys ever play that game Operation? <laughs> you know, remove the wishbone from his throat. And even if you had, like, hi, ah, oh. uh, 
like it's okay. I have a little bit of sadness. Oh, good. So I might be able to catch up. Well, I like that answer. You're fine. We, You just missed me going off on a tangent of theoretical pixel info. <laughs> well, I recorded it also. Great. Here you go. Thank you. And we'll see. Have any questions about the lasso? No, I just I feel like I have like just like the outlines. Yeah, I mean if you have like a surgeon surgeon's hand. So here's the thing: the next one that I'm going to show you basically makes being just ace at that unnecessary because the computer will do it all for you. So yeah. So, okay. Yeah, I can find the proper one. Okay. We can buy a lasso now. Good. And we are going to copy this ginkgo as promised. Remember, I said we'd break that loaf and the fish and beat everybody. <laughs> but I'm going to show you some better ways to select first. Okay? But if I did want to make a copy of this ginkgo, and I'll, I'll show you what I just did in a minute, but like, we can do better. We can do better than that. Look at that. See how it's got, I got some asphalt on there, you know. We can do better than that. And the thing is, you know, you could, you, could, you could be painstaking and meticulous and spend all day going around and getting it perfect. But, like, maybe with, like, the first version of Photoshop, you'd have to do that. But they've got improvements on these tools. And actually, let's go ahead and look at that. So, the first hotkey I want to show you tonight is Command-D. And on a PC... If you happen to be a PC owner, bless your heart, it's control D. So anytime I say command, I really mean control if you're under the affliction of PC use. Um, so command D is deselect, and I'll show you where it is up in the tree. It's right here. And you see that little squiggle? If you're, if, if you're not familiar with it, that's command, the squiggle. And then the shift is the up arrow. That one is the, oh gosh, is that alt or control? It's option, I think. And option is the alt button. So for you PC folk, you, I'm sure you know the alt button. You know, alternate, optional, same kind of thing. Um, but I'll, I'll throw out a lot of hotkeys tonight. You can use them if you want. You can not use them. Um, they speed things up a whole lot for you. Just going to tell you right now. The opposite of Command D is Command. Who knows this? No. Deselect. Select nothing. What's select everything? Command A. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Command A. And you see it made a outline. There's also an inverse. Because sometimes it's easier to select not what you want and then flip it. <laughs> All right, so Command D to reset, okay? And then let's go over here and let's look at the magnetic personality version of the lasso. Now, has anyone in here used this tool? And does anyone in here like this tool? Because if so, we got beef. I do not like it. I hate this tool. But I'm going to show it to you anyway because some people like it and, hey, you know, Different folks for different strokes. So this one, basically, you, you don't hold the button down like we did with the last one, but you want to kind of go right up to the edge of it, and you want to click and let go, and then be surgically precise as you slowly follow the outline of the shape you want to get, and it should make these little squares, which one would think are progress points, but actually mean absolutely nothing. Because if you slip your hand... You want to hit escape, and you're going to have to start right over again, my friend. 
You get no second chances with this tool. You'd think it'd be like a mountain climber, like laying in, back up, you know, whatever you'd call those mounts or whatever, but nope. Now the, the computer algorithm or whatever that it's using to make this and allow this to be smart for you is basically the same amongst all these tools. And I'll tell you right now, it's not looking at color. It's not looking at color. It's looking at value. It, it's, it's looking at this almost as if it's black and white. But really what it's looking for is edges. Right? It's looking for edges. If you have something with soft edges, this is not going to work too well for you. How did it work for you guys? Oh yeah, sorry. I think I forgot. Your the idea is to go all the way back to the start point and then give it one more click and it'll finish. If you double click before that or prematurely, it's just going to make a straight line from there to your start point, which you may not want. If you need to start over, either hit escape and or command D and you can start over. It works fairly well for this leaf, but I'm actually going to show you a much easier, better tool. So you wouldn't really even need to use this, but we just like to teach this tool in case. Some people like it. Back in the day, it was a good one to use. To give you an example where there's not very much of an edge to get that would be harder is this, say I'm trying to get this um, water droplet. I mean, it's, it's having a much harder time. It's doing it, but it's really only barely trying to get it because that's a softer edge and in fact in a couple of these places it's completely missing lost edge see look it doesn't know what to do here you see that you guys kind of see oh see no that ain't right that ain't right oh god that's what happens when it's really going crazy No, it will be to copy it, yes. Um, we're just going from worst to best tool. We got two more tools to look at, and then we will actually copy it. But hopefully you'll see kind of a progression of getting towards closer to easier to use. We'll save the best for last. So that's the magnetic lasso. Uh, I would not worry about mastering this tool. You'll probably never need to use it after I show you these other two. I could be wrong. I never touch it myself. The really the only way the only the only time I use the lasso is if I don't want a precise selection. If I really want something really rough like that, I'll use it. If I actually want it precise, I'll never touch it. But if we go one tool down, we have the magic wand and the quick selection tool. All right, they're closely related. They use a similar computer think system of making the selection, looking for edges and contrast in those edges. But they work a little bit differently. So let's look at the magic wand first. It looks like a little wizard's magician's wand, if you will. And so what we want to do is click, um, just click right in the middle of that center ginkgo leaf and see what you get. That's what I got. We'll talk about why I got that in just a moment. But basically the way that this tool works is you hit one pixel, try, try some other places, try out here, try up here, just do new clicks, you'll kind of see different things happen, okay? So what this tool is doing is you're hitting one pixel and then it's looking at all the pixels touching that pixel, all eight of those pixels touching that pixel, and it's saying, hey, is this close to what I, they clicked on? Yes, let's keep going. And then it does it again and again and again. And it keeps selecting until it gets to a point where it's like, nah, you're too different. You can't come in the clubhouse or whatever. And the, what determines that is tolerance, right here. 
So the higher that number, the more tolerant it is, the more it's going to grab. So just to give you an example, if you're like me and you're not getting enough with just a random click on your leaf, you need to raise your tolerance. If you're getting more than just the leaf, if you're getting gray, you definitely need to bring that down. So I'm at a 20. I'm going to go up to a 32. And then I'm going to resample. Getting closer. How about 40? Sounds like I'm gambling over here. Oh, almost there. Here's my next. Are you on the magic wand tool? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. I'm skeptical here because it should be right there. Oh. You're in the middle of a failed selection, so it's scary. You're on the quick selection tool, not the magic wand. I was kind of totally get you on that. Now give that a shot. Oh, and you were too. Yeah, I knew it. Yeah. Gotcha. It's uh, easy to. They, they really should just separate them out. I don't know why they don't. I really don't know why they don't. It's one of my biggest complaints with Adobe. Everybody else getting that okay though so far? Okay. So. I'm still clicking on here, not quite getting enough. Let me go up a little bit more. 48. Come on, seven. Almost. Ideally, I want to get all of the leaf and nothing else. Because if I go too high, I'll start getting more stuff, and I don't want more stuff. See, look, it bled up into that leaf. I don't want that. So maybe 55. Yeah, that's close enough. It's it's pretty darn close. So that's one way to approach it. That's a pretty cool tool. It's pretty useful. And if you hold the shift button down, you can... I thought I turned the volume down on that thing. I guess I didn't. Hmm. Maybe it doesn't even work on the PA anymore, but... If you hold shift down and continue to click, you'll you'll keep adding more to your selection. But I'm gonna stop us all right here. Well, I'm about to stop us all right here. Did anyone else have any questions on Magic Wand? The next tool I'm gonna show you is the one you're gonna wanna use almost all the time. And that is the quick selection tool. Now it's a new tool, not that new, but it's maybe they came out with it eight, nine years ago. And after that, it's like, why use any other tool, you know? So if you hold the button down, and let's go to the quick selection tool, which a lot of you guys had initially. I'm going to hit Command D. Now, I've got my little highlighter on. But do you see how I'm, like, increasing and decreasing the size here? So it's a brush-based tool. So you do have a cursor that is your brush, all right? Everyone should see a circle. It might be a different size than mine, but I'm going to tell you how to size it. Does everybody see that circle? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before you start clicking and selecting, because check it out, this is what we're going to do. And you'll see how that works in just a second. But for now, um, I want to make sure you can size it, because see, when I come down here to do the tail... Um, of the stem, I'm going to have to change it to a smaller one. So, the universal brush size hotkey in Photoshop is the bracket keys, which are the two buttons to the right of the P button, the funky parentheses, the brackets. So, the left bracket is smaller and the right bracket is larger. And if you don't see your cursor, that probably means you have caps lock on, which will hide it. So you'll have a little plus in the center, and then sort of the range of the thing is going to be that circle around it. Sort of like your range, okay? And then... What you want to do is, I recommend, so I'm going to start over, Command-D. I like to get it get it bigger than you think. You don't want it that big to where it's going outside. That's going to be too much. Something about like that, you know, maybe where you could fit, like, 
three or four of them in there and start in the center and you probably just have to do one click and to get most of it. And then you can reduce it down to be pretty small and just kind of do click and let go, click and let go and just kind of add it to the tail. Now if you go a little out of bounds, check this out, like if you have like a little bump coming off of there like that, if you hold down the alt button you'll see your little plus in the center turn into a little minus and then you will be able to remove and you can kind of edge it but ideally you don't really want to have to get to that point anyway oh Command selections. Command -y. like completely white So, yeah, escape will, it will cancel a process, like a, a tool that's kind of in the middle of something is escape. But command D is like once you're actually already looking at um, the ants. And how are we doing? You guys managed to get a good selection on there? Or at least semi-good? Because we're going to make a copy now. Ooh, excuse me. Any questions? Everybody got a good outline? Okay, I'm going to move on then. So, we're going to copy and paste this leaf. We're in, when we do that, we're going to automatically create a new layer. Because anytime you paste inside Photoshop, you always create a new layer directly above the one that you were just working on. Okay? And you can have many, many, many layers. You can see many, many layers, but you're only really working on one at a time, technically. Okay? So, the old-fashioned way is edit, copy, edit, paste. And if you know the hotkey, you can do that. If you're so inclined, it's Command-C, Command-V. All right. And hey, what happened? I don't see anything different. Well, that's because it has pasted it directly above the old leaf. But if everything went correct, we do have two leaves. And to reveal the other leaf, I'm going to show you a new tool, the very top tool. It's like a four-pointed arrow cross. It's the move tool. And simply click and drag on your leaf there, and you should have turned a new leaf, so to speak. Did that work okay for everybody? The move tool is pretty self-explanatory. Now, technically, we could move our background, but we're not going to do that. And anytime you see... The checkerboard, that means empty, clear, okay? White does not mean clear. It means white pixels. Checkerboard means no pixels. And the reason that we're not covering everything up when we move this around is because we selected just that and we only copied pixels there. So this bunch of pixels is alone on the layer by itself, all right? And that's what allows us to operate it independently. So the elevator pitch version of Photoshop layers, okay, is that in the old days, before computers were around to help photographers do this, what they could do is they could print it out or they could they could they could print it out on a glass plate. 
so they could get it to register and transfer to a glass plate. And then what they would have to do is put another glass plate over that picture and then maybe another one over that and then take another picture of the plates with the pictures on it. We can simulate all that in the computer a million times easier. But it's the same kind of concept. It's layering. So I'll give you another analogy um, if you've never really worked with layers before. Do you remember the old encyclopedias that had like the anatomy of the human body? And all those clear cellophane pages, they would have the different layers, like the lungs and the circulatory system and the guts and all that. Same idea. They layer one on top of the other. So you have a menu down here of your layers, among many other things. And you guys may have a bunch of extras, but the main two that I want you to look at, background layer at the bottom, that's where we started. One layer above that, layer one, probably is your copy leaf that you made, the duplicate that you just made. And um, the one thing that we want to look at right now, these little eyes to the left of the layers, those are hide and reveal. I want you to turn those on and off. Just click on, click off. So those will hide or show your layers for you. And that's actually a good way to figure out what layer is what. Because sometimes you'll have a ton of layers. And it can get confusing. But basically, your eyeball is up here looking down. So whatever is higher up in the stack superimposes what, whatever is under it. Just like when we move it with the move tool, this stuff's still under it. We just can't see it at that particular time. That's the beauty of layers, is you can have them independent and you can still have the stuff underneath exist without being overwritten. Does that make sense? You can merge them, but when you do that, you kind of get what you're looking at here and no, you know, no more independent layers. It's all just like kind of smushed down into one again. That is the most basic fundamental concept of Photoshop layers. It gets weirder from there. There's all kinds of things that we're not going to go into. There's all kinds of magic like this. You see that? All these different blending modes. We ain't going to get into that tonight, but it is what allows the whole... Looks like an alien. It's a ghost. It's the spirit of that leaf. That leaf died, and then that's its soul going to the afterlife. You guys see? No? I can, I can go even further. Now it's really going to be a ghost leaf. Woo. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um, but that, that, that's interaction between layers, blending modes. Um, it's a bit more advanced. But basically just having things on a separate plane, more or less. And we'll, we'll talk about this closer to the end of class, but I have this text layer here. Whoops. I mean, and it is independent. It's doing its own thing, you know? So, any questions on that? No? There's no limit to the amount of layers that you can have. Um, but the more that you start to add up and pile up, the bigger your file gets, the more complex it gets. Um, and also, the big takeaway here is not every file type supports layers. And a big file type, a one file type especially, that does not support layers is the JPEG. So if I save this as a JPEG, then this leaf that I'm so conveniently able to move around and rearrange and change and adapt will never be so easy again once I've gone to a JPEG. How do you retain layers? The easiest way, not the only way, but the easiest way to remember is always save as a Photoshop native file format document or a PSD. So, just to simulate, it's been a long day. I've been at work all day. It's been fun teaching you guys, but I'm ready to go home. So, before I go, eventually I want this to be a JPEG. So I can send it uh, as a picture to my mom in a text message. But... I'm not done with it yet, so we'll get there.
But for now, I want to put it down and I want to resume it tomorrow right where I left off and I want to be able to move this around. And also, right now this says, thank you very much class, but I want it to say, I really love you mom or something to that effect. So if I want to be able to retain all that information, do I go ahead and save it as a JPEG class? Absolutely not. So I want to save it as a Photoshop document first. So I would go up to File, Save As, and you guys can follow along because there's no point in me teaching you guys how to use this program if I don't teach you how to save a file. So <laughs> that wouldn't be too good. It's like, hey, flight lessons. We're going to learn all about flying. Landing, that's on your own. <laughs> you know, so um, this is sort of the finish line, right? So, of course, did, did everybody get this window open? Take that as a yes. Um, so, it, you know, like all programs, save as is like the first one you want to do. After that, you can just hit file save and it updates your file with the same name wherever you put it. But this is where you decide what it's named and where it's going to be. So we would name it here. We would decide where it's going to save right here. That's what all this bit is. So, you know, desktop, perhaps. Over here, we could say desktop. That's where it's going to say. We'll say I want to call it Ginkgo 2. All right. But here's the important part. You see where it says format down here? By default, it should say Photoshop. And that's what you want to do. When in doubt, save Photoshop layer. I got to figure out some kind of like, some kind of mnemonic for that. If you guys have any ideas, let me know. You know, like Red Sky at Night, Sailor's Delight. It's like, save it as a Photoshop, not a JPEG. You know, you can always save it as a JPEG later. If you look at this list, you got a ton of options, including JPEG and many, many others. Some of them will keep your layers, but you know what? Photoshop will always keep your layers. So do Photoshop. See that little check by the layers? That's how you can rest assured that all your layers are going to be safe and protected when you hit that save button. You take it off, <laughs> good luck. So that's what we would do. I'm going to hit cancel, but that's exactly how I would save every file. Now, are there some drawbacks? Yeah. You're going to need Photoshop or a similar program to open a Photoshop document, whereas just about everything and its uncle can open a JPEG. But, you know, if you need to go back in and be able to move a layer around and change things, you're going to need something like Photoshop anyway. So any questions on that? All right. Not really. Okay. Bridge is more of a organization file browser tool. Okay. Um, the lack of support between those programs, I believe personally, is completely intentional on the part of Adobe. So you have to buy the whole suite. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Although you can, uh, so so when when you do have situations like that where. Say you're just trying to copy and paste from one to the next and it doesn't seem to work out. It may not work out, but one thing you can check is file export or import. Mm -hmm. okay, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, let's see. Every now and then you get lucky and you can copy and paste stuff, but... It all depends. Like, So, what? What? give me an example of what you're moving. Well, I do a lot of of line art into that needs to be edited. So in uh, Photoshop, in both programs, some and for instance, our logo was created in um, Illustrator. That's okay. the easiest place to work with it. Yeah. That's the easiest place to delete and edit and that kind of thing. But it, it's difficult sometimes to move that into Photoshop unless I copy. Sometimes if I just open it, I'll get. Oh, you can't do that. No. Well, one thing, have you tried this file place? Yeah, it, it, and that'll if, work sometimes. If that doesn't work, it probably ain't meant to be. Right. But copy and paste, it'll usually pop up that little uh, question first, and it'll say, do you want pixels? Do you want vectors? Um, you get different results. Um, pixels is usually what I do. Right. It's, it's, it's easy to get... 
It's easy to turn vector into pixels. It's a whole other ball game to go the other direction. Okay. Yeah. Um, Photoshop can do vectors, but I personally think it's terrible at it. Okay. Yeah. But file place is the best way to get um, like another image into your current image. I mean, I could have opened this tiger up. I could have done it like this, open that up, select it, copy it, go back to that one, paste it. Right. But file place is just easier way to do that. So that's how I like to add things. In. And also in Illustrator to place. And definitely in InDesign, you have to do that. Right. It's like a Right. No, they kind of speak different languages, so you kind of... You have to do your own translation. Bridge is not really a translator. You'd think with the name, but it's basically all the organizational features. A lot of those they rolled into Lightroom mm -hmm. for photos. But um, Bridge was just for people that are using a lot of different software, and it's managing the files between the software. But it doesn't really help you with converting. And Well, I say that. That's not exactly true. No. Not so much with um, Illustrator. Okay. More just different um, raster photo types. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, you're good. I want to show you guys some more things that you could do with a, with an object or a layer inside Photoshop. Okay, the first one is transparency. So, like the government, we're going to be 100% transparent with this layer. Okay? Just kidding. <laughs> Please read the fine print, everybody. There's a little slider right here on your layer. There's one for every layer. It says opacity. And if you click that little down arrow, you get a slider and check it out. Oh, whoa, wrong one. We're sorry. You can you can kind of make it ghostly. So it's still taking up all these pixels. Like if I do a selection, it's still there, but they're only 29% there. Crazy, right? Now, benefits of this are huge, and when you guys take the Photoshop for Photographers class, which you guys are all taking, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll actually get to see that in effect. So, Healing Brush uses this concept. Um, you can also use this with Clone Stamp too. You know, a lot a lot of things. Um, this is very useful in. So, not everything has to be full force. It can be kind of transparent or reduced. So that's one thing. And the other thing I want to show you is transformation and rotation. So we're moving it, but we can also change it in some other ways. If we go up to edit, and then right about halfway down is an option called free transform. Click that. And it should produce what's called a bounding box around your leaf. And this allows you to transform it so you can stretch it. If you drag by the corner, you'll scale it. If you hold the shift button down, you'll stretch it while you drag. And then if you hover just outside the corner, you can rotate it. You got to be just outside the corner, and it'll turn into a little curly cue like that. I did that all the time by accident. <laughs> the rotator? Just when you're trying to click on the box. And oh, yeah, it yeah. A small box. It always gives you the one you don't want, you know. Yeah. And looky there. Now I can actually see some issues that I had there. How many of you guys see a little bit like a, an area where you got a little too much on your leaf and you've got some asphalt left over? Anybody? Not really? Well, I'll just demo and you guys can kind of follow along um, to an extent. I want to show you the zoom tools. Everybody good on transformation? I, I think I forgot to mention one thing. When you're done transforming, hit return or enter. 
if you really aren't liking what you've seen that you've transformed, you can hit escape and it'll cancel it and you'll go back to where you were. And something to always keep in mind is the undo button. So it's edit and the first one, undo. It'll say undo and whatever you were just about to undo. Or command Z. That's almost universal. Or control Z if you're in the unfortunate PC camp. Command Z is undo? Is undo. Command D? Command D? Command D is deselect. 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 So it's select nothing. It's basically clear as command D. Um, the weird thing is, it only takes you back one step. Or does it? Oh, they fixed that! Hey guys, keep hitting command Z as many times as you can. Does it keep going back and back and back and back? Oh yeah. Heck yeah! It didn't used to do that. It did not used to do that. It saved me many times. <laughs> it's about time. Well, it used to only go back one step, and then you had to go and do a different one. It was like Command-Shift-Z or something silly like that. So I'm glad they fixed that. They also fixed when you're stretching it, you used to have to hold Shift to keep it proportional. Now you have to hold Shift to not keep it proportional. It makes so much more sense because usually when you're scaling something, you want to keep it you know, proportional. You don't necessarily want it all surface mirror. Okay, so now the zoom tools. Unless we have any questions on undo or transform. Okay, we're good. All right, then. Zoom tool. So the very, very bottom tool. It's a little magnifying glass. That's like Martha Stewart living right there. Look. Okay. Martha uses Photoshop all the time. So a couple ways you can use this tool. You can click and click and click and click and click, 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 click. click. Or you can hold the button down and drag left to right, which is what I like to do. That's called Scrubby Zoom. Scooby and Scrappy Doo. Yeah. And those are the main two ways. Um, if you do go in and now you need to go out, you can hold down the option key and the little plus will turn into a little minus. And you can zoom way out. But never strain your eyes to work on something because you can always zoom in closer to get a better, better range on it, a better view. Okay? Any questions on that thus far? Okay. And then there's one more I want to tell you. If you're way hopelessly lost without a prayer of getting back, the take me home hotkey is command zero. Not command O, that's open. Command zero. Fit on screen. It's very helpful. And very useful. And you guys are doing awesome tonight. You sure I'm not going too fast? All right. Any questions on any of that? Okay. The hand tool. The hand tool only works when you're zoomed. Well, I don't know. Let's try it. Try it without being zoomed in. It's the hand right above the zoom tool, and you should be able to just kind of click and drag left to right, up down. It's more useful when you're zoomed in and you kind of need to go around. Now see, we're getting, here's, here's some digital artifact. Well, that's actually reflected light. That's pretty darn cool. 
But what we're looking at here in a digital image, it's only a simulation of the reality that's going on, you know? The picture of this leaf, it's not a bunch of little squares. It's a person, man. But I can show you an example. When, when you get to digital edges, now that we're zooming in, I want you guys to kind of explore around and look at some of the edges and, and notice that they are not what you think they are. It's almost like this. It's, it's almost the exact same phenomenon. Or a razor under a microscope. Oh, you think it's sharp, do you? You think it's sharp? That's what it, that's what it looks like. Oh, no wonder that razor hurt last night. Look at that. Whoa. <coughs> it might appear smooth relatively, but it ain't. You know? Um, let me see. Let's see. Bad, bad, bad cut and paste Photoshop. Let me see if I can get an example. I used to know of one real good one. It was Daryl Isaacs and on the uh, on the phone book of all, on the back of the phone book. Okay. Somebody got paid to do that. And it was so bad. It was such a bad copy and paste job. Here you go. Something like this. What about on the, Look at that. That's bad. Have you seen the, is it Hot Fuzz? Or it's that one with Melissa McCarthy. And they photoshopped her on the, the movie, like, poster. Oh. And it was a bad photoshop. For, she was in Hot Fuzz? Or not Hot it's, It was one of those that, I think it was the one that she did was uh, Sandra Bullock. The Heat. Was it? The Heat. That's what oh, it was. The Heat. Oh, okay. I've it seen, like um. Bad photoshop. Everybody was talking about how. I've seen St. Vincent. That was funny. <clears throat> huh. Let me look it up. The Heat, you said? Yeah. There's I with the kids, oh, I ain't got no kids. Don't be now. I ain't got no kids. I am the kid, if you haven't noticed yet. Okay. I thought maybe it had any nationalism. <laughs> <laughs> no, not not this guy. The he M Melissa McCarthy bad copy paste. Let's see if we can find this because I, I want to see this is funny. It was the poster? Yeah, it was the movie. It was either the movie poster or whatever was on the uh, DVD like cover. What was that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like her. Well, see, this is a low res image. See how it didn't get any better? Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but. I've never even heard of this movie. Well, something looks real bad with the tip of that RPG. Yeah, something looks funky with it, doesn't it? Well, you can tell they're not... Like, they tried to sculpt her. Yeah, and they're not in the same lighting. No. But you can also see, like, uh, there's that... Have you guys ever seen the movie JFK? Where they're, like, doctoring the photo of Lee Harvey Oswald, and the shadows are going the wrong directions. But, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that. That definitely looks kind of funky. But yeah, if I go back to these, like, there's all kinds of cool tricks to help you with doing that. We didn't go into it with the, um, the ginkgo that we made, but like, you know, an old school Photoshop, just using the lasso tool, you're going to get this. There's all kinds of cool tricks that we don't have time to go into tonight that help it not be so bad. But every once in a while, you'll see a really bad copy-paste job where it's just like, it looks like a cardboard cutout on there. It just don't look right. You know? Um, but there's lots of tricks to help with that. The reason that is? Oh, gosh. This family already looks kind of horrific. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Oh, that's horrific. You know it was. I worked all week on that. Oh, gosh. It's like, remember that band Nelson? With like Ricky Nelson's kids? 
If you don't, that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, it it's 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 subtle thing because there's different backgrounds on there, so they kind of have a different halo going on. Um, and you get different results. Here it's not too bad because we moved it gray on gray, you know. Um, you can kind of see it right here that it's kind of superficial looking, but um, as an object curves in real space, you know, it's not a distinct edge. We're not like flat pieces of paper walking around. There's a curve that, you know, has to be accounted for. It's things we don't think about when we're looking at the world all day long, but when you start to mess with it in there, you know, it, it, it gets real real quick. Okay, so those are the selection tools. Let me see what else we have in store for all y'all. Let's look at some filters. So all these things that we're talking about from here on out are just like utterly basic tip of the iceberg kind of kind of thing. There's a ton more where it came from. We just don't quite have time to go into it. We're going to look at some filters. Now, how many of you guys in here do Instagram? Yeah? Just two? Three? Kind of? Do you do snack chat? Do you do kick? I'm not big fan. I think that's like the younger. What's the other one? There's even yet a newer one. Unless you're a parent. Yeah. Because I have to, you know, see what he's doing on there. There you go. You gotta be careful. They, I mean, they broadcast their whole lives. These guys. Yeah. Well, then you got the kids that have got like multiple accounts. One for what was it they were talking about on Inside Edition. One for like the parents. Oh, sure. And then they yeah, got yeah. another that's kind of like for like all their friends. Stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, that is what they called that. The fake Instagram, right? Yeah. The Finstagram. Well, the the Finsta, that's the one where they put up what they want to put up. Right. Oh, okay. You know, like the one with their actual name and their picture. That's the one that they want the parents to see. But yeah, then they have the other one where it's that's the the interesting stuff. Their handle. Yeah. yeah. Like Folklies. Yep. All right. Well, so there's different. Sounds like it. Young for life alert. Too old for Snapchat. I don't Snapchat. I don't. Honestly, if you look at how many Snapchats, you don't need life alert. Somebody will see it within 30 seconds. There you go. The more embarrassing, the quicker they see it. Well, they know it's not just one for you. It'll be your mom. No one has to die on you. Yeah. Siri, eject to get me out of here. Uh, Bail out, Siri. Alexa. Land this plane. Um, so we were looking at blending modes a minute ago. They're kind of like a filter. Let's just go ahead and start there. Um, so we all have our single leaf, right? Still, I hope. Okay. That's good. I'm glad nobody heard it. Um, so right here under, um, this is the blending mode here, where it says normal. Go ahead and try a few more out. <clears throat> now, what these are doing is, it's basically, the simplest way to put it, it's applying a math equation to all the pixels. It's applying a math equation to all the pixels that are over top of other pixels. So it's, you know, it's not doing anything anywhere else except on the leaf, and it's, calculating the pixels and the color and what it looks like and all that fun stuff of the leaf and also combining that with whatever is underneath it. Wasn't that a class for basics? Mm, I really would ha I'll have to I'll have to look online here. Be next month, there will be one next month. I just don't happen to know the date yet because we only have the one month at a time schedules, unfortunately. Thank you. But there'll be one. Have a good night. So normal, of course, is normal. Um, I'll go over a few real quick. Multiply only shows the darker colors through, and it basically makes the lighter colors um, transparent, with white being 100% transparent. So since this is kind of a light image, it basically goes away. Screen is the complete opposite of that. It takes all your darks out. 
it's sort of like a a battle between light and dark, if you will. <laughs> he was photoshopped too. FC, it all comes back. I'm kidding. If it's CGI, yes, a lot of those. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, Carrie Fisher, young Carrie Fisher, and 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 uh, what's his face? Oh man, that was so bad. Peter like, Cushing. It was. It was so painful to watch that. It didn't scene. look right. Did no, it? it did not. You guys familiar with the Uncanny Valley effect? Mm -mm. Oh, you don't know Uncanny Valley? Uncanny Valley is a concept. It came around with like cyborgs and stuff like okay so what it is is when something isn't a real human but it's sort of like a facsimile of a human like a doll or a mannequin mm -hmm. if it doesn't quite look human i mean it's roughly human but it's like obviously that's not a human it doesn't bug us but the closer it gets to looking like a real human when it's looking super realistic but you can totally tell it's not real it gets super creepy that's called the uncanny valley that show? Westworld? No, well, I haven't seen that one, but there's one that's similar to it, where it's the, they created the robots and the AI to sort of be servants, but then they start to take on emotions. Yeah. <gasps> it's like that, that though. Is that that Will Smith movie? Oh, that's um, uh, iRobot. Yeah, because that's that similar, of. but yeah. But it's like when it approaches a certain level of realisticness, it gets real creepy real quick. And then if it goes a little further, you can't even tell the difference. But it's like when you... It's weird, but it, it exists. If you've ever seen a doll that creeped you out, that's what it was. It was the Uncanny Valley effect. It's, I know, it's cool. Um, but anyhow, I'm a side tracker. Sorry. But, but you can kind of explore how these work. Like some here at the bottom, they only let... The hue or the saturation, the color. Luminosity is just like what it is, grayscale. Okay? And, of course, it changes based upon what it's over top of. So if I move the leaf here, and now I start messing with it, look, I'm going to get different. Look at that. See, I'm getting a different reaction based upon where it's overlapping the other leaf or where it's overlapping. Aha! Uh -huh. This is Photoshop magic. The magic. Although, these seem really neat. You don't use them that often. David, how often do you use the layer blending modes? Every now oh, and again? I or a lot? Really, now, a ton. Really? And, and this is just within the past month. I, I, I stumbled on something, and I was like, oh, that's awesome. I started, now it's like everything I'm doing. is deep, it. though, right? Like, yeah. I, but the thing is, I, like, I couldn't explain to anyone... How it works. Yeah, it's just I know. Like for different things. It just does different cool stuff. Just right. Like cycle through it. It's definitely something to look for. Like, that's the thing. The learning curve never stops with Photoshop, ever. And it's hard to replicate things. Too. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I can't explain how it works either. If I can bring up the math equation to show you, that's why I can't. That's why I can't explain it. Um, I did see it one time. There you go. You do the math. Uh, I don't know. It didn't pop up. But there... I was going to try to see. It was like, here you go. It's like some Goodwill hunting stuff over here. <laughs> like, look at this. But that's what it's doing. I just let the computer take care of that. So there's blending modes. They don't really change your pixels, though. That's the nice thing. Um, you can always change them back. So, you know, if I've... If I put it on hard light, you know, I mean, I can always change it back to normal. It's not permanently like that until I, like, flatten the layer or something like that or save it as a JPEG. The other filters, not quite so much like that. We're going to look at some blur filters because those are some that you might use. Um, those live up here under filter. Now, there is a whole world of filters. I'll show you that second. First thing, let's just take, let's do a simple blur. So we're going to go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and it'll pop up a little window. And make sure your little preview button is checked. And you see the slider down here? Drag that. Whoa, I really blurred it. So you've got like no blur. 
subtle blur, just a little, all the way to insane blur. Gaussian will equally obliterate. Yeah, so what Gaussian does is it just completely non-random. It's precise blurring. It blurs everything equally in the same way all over the place. The other blurs, not so much. So I'm going to hit cancel. Here's the thing. I hit cancel because once you hit OK, you're stuck with it that way. You're never getting it back unless you hit Command Z a bunch of times or go to an older saved version. It's not something you can flip back and forth with. So it's destructive, if you will. And that is the technical term. If I go here to blur and I do a surface blur, you'll see that, well, I put it right over top, you'll see it, it looks a little different. See how it's not messing with my outline, but it's just like blurring what's inside compared to the old one? Very different, right? You see how it's only blurring inside the borders. It's not blurring the edge. So that's the difference between a surface blur and a Gaussian blur. A Gaussian blur is going to go everywhere. Okay? Now there's many, many more that you can experiment with. And I want to show you another place which I'm going to let you guys play around in, like Willy Wonka land. If you go up to Filter, and then down to Filter Gallery, and then you may need to zoom a little bit, so this gets kind of confusing. Down in the very bottom left corner, you may hit that minus a couple times so you can get kind of a better viewpoint of what you're working on. Now, I happen to be on Glowing Edges, which is just one of many. If you open these trees down, like let's just take a look at the first one, Artistic. Click on a few of these and you'll see. See, cutout almost makes it look like vector, doesn't it? Now, have you used in vector, in Illustrator, have you ever used something called a live trace? Okay. Take our Illustrator class sometime because we'll show you that. Or just Google it. Okay. Well, that is sort of the poor man's way of turning a raster back into vector. But you get, you know, you have some issues with it, but. Okay. And, you know, for all of these, there are some settings here that you can dabble with. You know, as far as like how strong it is or, and you can apply multiple ones to this, but you can get some interesting looks here. Okay, and then feel free to just play around with all of these guys. You know, they kind of, with the little sailboat, kind of show you kind of an example of what it's going to do. Was it supposed to be this way? Okay. Anyway. I know, right? <laughs> we knew we were going to say this. All right. Uh, let's see. Photoshop filters. It's sort of like what we were talking about at the beginning of class, remember? Where you were talking about you don't want to completely, like, make the person into an elf necessarily. Yeah. Like, you know perfect skin and you guys remember the werewolf of London his hair was perfect you guys remember that uh, okay anyways <clears throat> I'd like to meet his tailor here's some examples you can really go overboard with this I mean they're fun but just drink responsibly <laughs> I saved my file and I'm still drunk. Oh yeah. I'd say like probably half the people in the graphic industry are No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if Jackson Pollock was a digital artist though, oh yeah. I can't get it to show it. Glowing edges is really cool, but you want to turn it down really low. I think it looks better when you like are barely doing it. Come on! Oh, you make me so mad, computer. Hey, Mr. 
Mr. Wilson. Forget it. I'm not even going to try anymore. I knew it was because I was... You can, you know, it's like anything. You can get the world and you can lose everything, too. Um, it just kind of depends. Ooh, those are cool. I would like to say subtly, uh, but hey, you know, have fun with it. But yeah, that's what real life looks like right there. Do you guys know about Google Deep Dream? <gasps> I hope only the clean pictures come up. Um, this is Google's Deep Dream. Is it like a procreate type thing? No, it's a computer. It's horrifi horrifying. Horrifying. Deep Dream, let me see. I'll just throw a picture in there. Deep Dream Generator. You can put any picture in, and the computer takes care of the rest. Um, it applies all this junk in there. Do I have to log in, really? I just want to do it now. Yeah, but I want to put my own picture in. Don't you ever want to have permission to Yeah, you know, when you when y'all do that old filter, you know, you're giving them your face up. Y'all know that. Uh, I have a picture of myself on here, I think. Yeah, there it is, but it doesn't matter. We'll go to JPEG. So there was that tiger. Turns it into this weird, I don't know, it's taking too long. I'm getting too sidetracked. But check it out sometime, it's neat. Um, so there's those filters, the filter gallery. There's all these menus down here that you can play around in as well. Remember, you're going to do it to the whole layer. So let's say I hide that layer and I'm on my background layer and I go to the filter gallery. And I'm doing my filters. See, it's going to do it to everything now that I'm on there. Whoa. It's like the, the moon landing version of Ginkgo's. I took that photo, by the way, in the parking lot. We have a bunch of Ginkgo's back there. Ginkgo's are cool. You know, they were amongst the first leaved plants. They're prehistoric. Before that, it was all like palm fronds and pine needles and like mosses and stuff. All right, so. What's next here? Um, blend modes, layers. We talk about layers. You can rearrange layers, and you can copy layers. So I want to show you that real quick. So let's go down here <clears throat> to our single leaf here that we've got, if everyone's still got it. Notice you're only working on one layer at a time, and that layer is highlighted in that gray silvery kind of color. So say you want to make a copy of that layer. It's super easy. You don't even have to go in here and select it again. You can just right click and then go up to duplicate layer. And now just hit OK. We don't need to change the name or anything. And now we have another one. We have a friend. Now one thing to keep in mind on the move tool that I didn't mention earlier that you probably would want to know about, otherwise you could have some hangups. There's this button right here, auto select. That can be a blessing and a curse if you have it on. If you don't have it on, you're always only going to be moving the layer that you are on right here. But if you have auto select turned on, you're going to go to whatever layer you click on. See, look, boom. If I click on that one, it's going to go to that one. I bet. I'm going to predict. What do you think? Oh, it was right. Oh. <laughs> it's sort of like pick the layer, pin the tail on the donkey or something. Spin the bottle of layers. All right. So that's one thing. I, I usually leave it off. 
However, sometimes when I have a million layers going on, I use it to find out what layer, you know, to just, instead of going through this whole thing, I'll just click on what I want. Problem is, problem is, if I had something like this, say it's just very subtly over there, say I want, I have auto select on and I want to get this ginkgo, it's going to always click that one and not the background when I click on it first, because it's like sort of there, so... Any questions on any of that stuff? You can also rearrange your layers, and you can do that down here by dragging them. So let me change something about one of these. See, David? Uh huh. If I do divide on that one, so check it out if I. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Put it up there. Turn on select off. Okay. So that looks very different from that, doesn't it? Because it matters how they're stacked. So just keep it in mind. And you you arrange them simply by clicking and dragging down here. It's not the most easy method to use, but it is the method that they have given us. Questions? No questions at all. These are kind of complex and I don't No, it's fine. Well, I, I'm going to take the advanced class next week, so it might be something better suited for that. Okay. That's fine. The second half of this handout, uh, I don't think we're going to do it because it's, it's hard. But I am going to show you some more stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. Now, we expound on that with Photoshop for Photographers, but that's a good question. <clears throat> so really, with that one, I can hide these copies. Oh, man, my voice started to sound really cool. <laughs> yeah. All right, cartoon time. I think it's your turn. Hey, kids, today. Like Bozo the Clown or something. Y'all made me lose my voice. All right, so um, <clears throat> adjustment layers is what you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> so in the old days, <clears throat> excuse me, in the old days, excuse me, guys, we would always go up to do them this way, okay? Image. And then adjustments, and then this is where you got all your adjustments. So you don't have to follow along, but just for example, let's say I want to change the hue and saturation. So I'd go to image, adjustments, hue and saturation. I do my adjustment. Do not worry about following along because I'm going to show you the better way. You'll never need to do it this way ever in your life. So I do my thing, and then okay, and I'm done. And now I'm left with my layer, and everything's back to how it was except changed. And I can go on and I can do more stuff, you know, and I can change things. But if I ever want to get these to not be red again, I would have to go all the way back to undo that. All right. So I had to hit Command Z a bunch of times there. Oh, there's a new way. All right. And that is the adjustment layers. So to see those... I want you to go kind of right up here where it says adjustments. Okay. So adjustments and properties work hand in hand. This is sort of your menu of which one you're doing, and then properties is like what you're setting it at. And what these do is they create a live, real-time layer, and that layer is not pixels itself, but it's affecting pixels under it. Okay. So let's do that same thing, and let's all follow along, everybody. Let's do hue and saturation, which is that one, the first one on the second row. Does everybody see that one? Mm -hmm. okay. When you click it, it'll automatically jump over to properties. And in here, this is where you can adjust stuff. So you can play with your hue. Hue, of course, is where on the rainbow you are. Roy G. Biv, guys. Red, orange, yellow, green. 
blue indigo violet. Ultra violet. And infra red. Wavelengths of light, guys. Back in physics class again. Red has the widest wavelength frequency and blue has the shortest. So that's why military lights have the red because you can't see them from far away because of that very phenomenon. It also has to do with how sound travels. So you know, like you can technically like the Doppler effect, like when a car is blaring the horn coming towards you, it sounds different than when it's going away. <clears throat> So that's that. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so you could do that adjustment. Here's the beauty, beautiful thing. Let's let's go ahead and do some more things. So every time I do anything, like when I make a change, like that or that or that or that, that's a step in my history. So if I hit Command Z, first it goes there, then it, you know, it does those movements, and it takes me you know, back all those steps. So, but, yes, go ahead. Sorry. So the, this adjustment layer, that is specific to which? Like, is it, a, it is a, an adjustment to all of the layers or just it, to? To everything under it. Okay. But here's the best thing. Here's the kicker. You saw how I was doing all these other things, making these changes. Well, if I'd done it the old way, I would. If I if I wanted to change these, say from a green to a blue to a red, I'd have to go all the way back in my history and change it. But check it out. All I have to do is go back to my adjustment layer, and I can change it no matter how many other steps I've done. It's infinitely editable. Now. Your question is poignant because it's affecting everything under it. Okay. You know how we know that? Well, by its nature, it always affects what's under it, but it's affecting everything under it because we have a solid white box right here. Mm -hmm. Let me show you one other thing. And if this is going kind of fast for you guys, don't worry about it because this is stuff that we... Well, I can, I can... I think it'll make sense. If not, just ask me. I'll explain it. But let's say I just had this one selected. See my ants? So if I wanted a different one, I could go up to adjustments, hue saturation, and now I'm just affecting that leaf. Okay? Because I only had it selected in the marching ants. And check it out. See that little thumbnail right there? White means it's, it's affecting it. Black means it's not. Black means it's not doing anything. It's masked out. These are masks. Now, how did you do that? I just selected it. Okay. So there's a, there's a cheat way of selecting something that's alone on a layer by itself, and I didn't tell you that yet. Okay. Are you ready? So if you've got something by itself on a layer, here's the cheat. You hold down the command button, and then... So my highlighter has gotten silly. Let me, let me restart. It's gotten offline try restart okay you see right here the layer thumbnail uh -huh. if you hold down command and click on it ooh, how right it's probably saved me like a week of my life already and i'm only 37 so i might be able to save another week before i die depends on how much photoshop i use though and how long i live or don't live <laughs> I'm here all week, guys. No, seriously, I am going to be here tomorrow till 9. But So if you isolate something and then you do an adjustment layer, it automatically is just going to do that spot that you had highlighted. So wherever you had selected with the ants, it's only going to be there. So it's automatically creating a mask. That goes for just about everything in Photoshop, right? It separates and segregates and divides. Um, I would like you guys to explore some of these other ones on your own. I'm going to um, give you guys the opportunity to. You can stack up as many as you want. If you, if you want to. Another thing I like about these 
is that you can turn them on and off just by clicking that little eye. Not only can you infinitely adjust them, but you can turn them on and off. Alien Ginkgo Predator. It's like the Predator's blood. Um, I'll turn that one off. Let's try some others. So a big one is going to be this one, Levels. Now, Levels doesn't affect color. Levels is all about the relationship of lights and darks. Ooh, it's almost hard to look at. Is it like a histogram? I've got the golden ticket. You know what's, uh, is it what now? Is it like a histogram? Yeah, we are looking at a histogram, but it's, it's affecting the relationship of all the pixels inside the histogram. So for example, by narrowing these two, my darkest dark is now even darker, and my lightest light is even lighter as I scoot these closer together. And if you get them super close, you're basically going to have a, like a binary image. It's going to be as close to solid white and solid black <laughs> as it possibly can be. And it gets real extreme looking. Usually you don't move them that far. If you move your midpoint higher, everything will trend darker. And if you move your midpoint to the left, lower, it'll trend lighter. So basically, any histogram you can read, if you've got the image here, you can understand how this works. So the brights are always on the right, darks are always on the left, and then the height is the frequency. See this huge peak right here? That's all the gray. These little bumps right here, that's the yellow of the ginkgo. How do I know this? You can figure it out. You can figure it out. On a simple image like this, you can totally tell that that's the gray. This little hump right here are the dark parts in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not rocket science. Um, and then below that is this one here is contrast. So the closer you move these together, the less variation you have in there. Because now your brightest bright isn't as bright as it was. This is the range that you have, like the median. So, I mean, you can get down to almost nothing if you want. You want to see another really cool phenomenon, guys? Remember how I was doing this earlier? Gosh, it looks so bright, it's hard to look at. It's like the sun. You know what's funny? It's really not any brighter than just a solid white piece of paper. You do know that, right? It's actually not any brighter. It's an illusion. I love this. Sorry, guys. My background is in art and painting, and I absolutely love this. It's an illusion. It's not really that bright. Let me show you. I'll prove it to you. See that? Is that hard to look at? Because it's like super bright. What about that? <laughs> kind of see what I did there, though? It's like, as this gets brighter, like it really like looks like it's really screaming, doesn't it? But like, it's almost like looking at a photo. The, the it's an illusion. Sun. Yeah. But it's not. You know what it is? It's all in how it's organized here. Like you've got these really high concentrations of bright color around it, which you don't have here. But that right there is equally the same white. Mm -hmm. It's just a really cool illusion. So we have to learn all about that stuff when painting. But yeah, it's neat. I've always found that fascinating that like it's such an illusion. It actually looks like it's kind of glowing. Like, ah, oh, okay, it's radioactive. It's kind of neat. Just kind of a, uh, a little tip, things will tend to print darker than they look on your computer screen. And that's something to bear in mind. You know, whenever you're, if you're getting real into producing print materials, always proof it a bunch because it will almost never look like it does on your screen. You can adjust, you can fix all that, but you'll have to fix all that because it won't do it for you. The screen itself is just a version of that image. It, you know, if you take it to a different computer and open it up on a different monitor, it can look totally different. There's, there's the prime example right there. And they make these things, which I have at home and I never use it anymore, but you like hang it in front of your monitor and it like looks at your screen and it, yeah, there it is. It hangs like that, it's pretty cool. 
But you guys probably don't have to get into all that. But a lot of photographers and, you know, designers and printers and stuff, they use these a lot. What is it called? These are monitor calibration spiders, like probably the... Is that just to keep it trimmed? Yeah. It calibrates it. You calibrate one monitor to look like the other. Um, Ultimately, it calibrates your printer profile. Preci precisely. You get it closer, so you're looking at the same thing on the screen. Look, I can actually show you guys, like, Windows, I'm oh, sorry, not Windows. Windows probably does. I know Mac has its own calibrator mm -hmm. that you can go into. Like, if I go in here to this, and you'll see how, I mean, I'm not worried about hurting anything. Um... I don't know why it's not letting me do the um, the advanced ones. Here you go. Like, it's looking a little different, doesn't it? With when with a camera, white balance is the big one. Metering too. Calibrating your sensor, yeah. You know, like they do strobes and they do all kinds of stuff. So you can calibrate uh, a camera too. It's more into like the art. It could be anything, but I mean, most of the time you don't have to mess with that. Um, you know, in the old days, they used to hold up those little gray chips. Somebody's got a phone call. Yeah, <laughs> like you, you would hold up those little chips and take a photo of them, or white balance. I get one of those, I can adjust to the printer's actual tone. There are mm, I don't know. The printer is always going to be different because it's ink. Well, kind of, but yeah. The monitor, so what the monitor is going to do is it's going to try to make your screen show you as close to the true appearance of the pixels that you're messing with. But if you hand that off to a printer that's calibrated differently, that doesn't even matter, you know? So you can't calibrate them to each other? Well, you kind of can, but, but sure. these monitor calibrators don't. Okay. It's like, well, for nice, it's just the, the, technically there used to be one person that would like profile all the images and her monitor was calibrated to whatever the printer profile was that we used. But, yeah. Uh -huh. Things can still... Sometimes the quality of the paper, like you have a really oh, I, thin, crappy paper, right. everything's going to look really saturated and gross. For me, it's always the the colors are off. So, for instance, our logo is teal and gray. I know the actual RGB and and the Cinnamon case, but our printer prints it blue, and I'm trying to figure out. Well. Are you sure they're both in RGB mode or both in CMYK mode? Because if they're not both the same, you'll have huge color. It doesn't things. seem to matter whether I, which way I print it. It's, it's blue rather than teal oh. in both modes. Oh, well, it definitely will matter well, in most cases. Um, okay. So if you want, definitely, so if you're, if you're taking it from Photoshop to the printer, You'd go to image mode and then make sure you're in RBG. Okay. But then your printer has to be looking for RBG too. Okay. But yeah, you you definitely want to have them the same. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there there's there's cases now where they're smart enough to know kind of what you meant, but sometimes and at least they didn't used to. I'm not sure if it's this printer because in it, it we bought this one because it was the newer bigger version of the one that we had had as our segment before, but this is just not what Oh, you're talking about like an actual machine that you're printing versus like a company that prints it. Yeah, no, yeah, to oh, us, yeah. period. Oh, okay. Not the printer, like the person, a, com a, a, a separate company. Mm. No, we, we're not that big. 
I would just say proof proof it a lot, but but in addition to that, you could look into calibration stuff. I'm looking in here to try to see it's in here somewhere. And it, and it really here, wait. Well, you know, like it could be the printer is the printer is fine and then your monitors or someone's monitor is is set differently so it's appearing differently. Um somewhere in here you can No, because it still prints correctly on the old machines. Huh. Yeah. Well, I guess it's your new printer then. So I, I didn't realize that, that you can calibrate this thing. So I'm going to give that oh, a yeah. before we... Yeah, you definitely can. Like, um, somewhere, small, here it is. Color handling. Printer manages colors. Photoshop manages colors. Mm -hmm. There's there's stuff to look at. Like, um, that's color management. That's interesting. Color, there's colorometers. They're real expensive. Um... And I'm not seeing it somewhere in here. Have you guys ever seen that list of like, you know, it was like Adobe 1984 and, you know, like all the different, um, I'm trying to remember, but there's all those different like color map options. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Not really. Um, thank you. Okay. Lab color is even weirder, but um. Does the advanced Photoshop or the Photoshop for, for the photographers? Oh yeah, that'll be me next week. This, I'm not. I don't think that that's something for me, but the advanced ones. There really isn't an advanced anymore, like by that name. I think it's just uh, you know, Photoshop Basics. Photoshop for photographers, colorize a black and white photo, and I think that's it now. Oh, I thought I saw it. Oh, okay. We may have called it that years and years ago. These are worth checking out, though. I mean, you don't need to get something like this. I, I've had one for a long time. I don't get it out too much more, but I mean, I do digital painting, and but I mainly just proof it. I just I just have my file ready to edit. I have them proof it for me, you know, a small swatch of it or something, and then I can just adjust from there. It's never looked the same on paper as it did on my screen, ever. Well, no, and it won't. But I mean, this is a significant difference. I mean, I this see. is the difference between light teal mm -hmm. and almost like turquoise. Yeah, I would. I would check and see what your your file, like your 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 image settings are in Photoshop, um, and 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 test you know test different ones. Try try it in CMYK. Try it in um, RGB. Try it in eight bit. Try it in sixteen bit. Okay. I know somewhere in here there's like the color. I, that's what I was trying to look for. Give me one second, because. Um, Tables, color settings. That's it, I think. Edit color settings. Here we go. This is what I was talking about. Did you ever mess with this before? No. See how it's US web coded SWOP? Like, you got to make sure these kinds of things look at all that. I mean, like, I don't well, know. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and that's specific to this software, though. This is specific to every software, so I'm really thinking. Oh, it messes up on everything. Yeah, it does it if I print it from Publisher. It does it if I print it from InDesign. It does it if I print it from this. So I'm thinking... It's the printer. Yeah. That's the common denominator, right? But this is stuff you usually don't have to go in and mess with, but just... That would sc look I at all that. Like, I mean, If I saw all that, I'd be like, shit. I know. I agree. I don't know what to do now. I broke it. 
I it's crazy. Like I just kind of leave it where it is. But see, there's Epson, Fujifilm, Canon. I mean, they have all the oh, different, just, the brands, yeah. just subtle little differences. But um, policies, policies they call it. But yeah, this is what I was thinking of. I guess it depends on the country. Depending yeah. company will have a profile. Yeah. Yeah, it's my printer. Printer too. I'm not sure, but there might be something. Right. Because you, you could just adjust. Every. And when I Google it, I get all of the really technical mumbo jumbo. And then, then, and then you call the the help desk, and they're just rude. So. so you guys know how like every color has an identity. Yes. Which is right here. Yeah. So it's the numbers. So that, that's something theoretically you could punch in on any computer to get that correct color, but it may look different from one monitor to the next or one printer to the next. So that's where the calibration comes in to try to get it, to try to get all those lined up. Beyond that, I don't really know a lot more about it, but you know, this one will always be 237-19146. And it's a different brand printer than the one you have before? No, it's the same brand. It's the bigger... Better, better model because you know the one we had we we went from a three-person 